Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this final session in our fall series. We did want to let you know that we are planning to come back in 2021 with another webinar series for you. We are tentatively thinking about a series on aging. We do want to let you know that all of our sessions are recorded and available on archive. If you miss a session, you can catch it later. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce you to our fabulous team. Wendy Lynch is an extension agent with the University of Florida in Putnam County. Julie England is an extension agent emeritus with the University of Florida. Dr. Wendy Dahl is an extension specialist with the University of Florida in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. Dr. Carlin Rafi is an assistant profession, professor and extension specialist with the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods and Exercise, <clears throat> excuse me, with Virginia Polytech Institute and State University. And I can't see all of this. Uh, Dr. Julie Garden Robinson is a professor and food and food and nutrition specialist with the Department of Health, Nutrition, and Exercise Sciences with the North Dakota State University. And I am Kendra Zamoyski with the University of Florida IFS Extension. I'm a regional specialized agent. All of our sessions are recorded and available on our landing page, so you can check them out for later viewing please complete the short, the short survey that you'll get after the webinar. You'll also receive a certificate of attendance that's available at the end of the Qualtrics evaluation. If you like your sessions, our sessions, please tell your coworkers. And I think everybody is more than familiar with Zoom, uh, but we do take questions in the chat box. So please make sure that your messages in the chat box go to the panelists only or to all participants and the panelists. And we do have a disclaimer, the information provided is for educational purposes only. Any reference to a commercial product does not constitute an endorsement by the webinar team or their institutions. Hello, this is Julie Garden Robinson from Fargo, North Dakota. I'm at North Dakota State University and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Laura Bauer earned graduate degrees in community nutrition and also credentialing as a registered dietitian nutritionist from Colorado State University. Her doctoral research was developing a course on food and non-alcoholic beverage fermentation, along with extension outreach materials. She did postdoctoral work with Colorado State University Extension on food safety and fermentation education. And she has taught food and non-alcoholic fermentation at the university extension and public level. Laura loves to share the art and science of fermentation and we're really happy to have her sharing her knowledge with all of you. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. And I guess I can advance there. Double check that I'm, I am unmuted. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, Julie, for the introduction. And I am so happy to be here with you today to talk about fermentation as the final session in this series. Um, so welcome to my webinar on Guide to Home Fermentation, Food and Non-Alcoholic Beverages. I have two interrelated objectives for you today. Two, number one, identify three entry fermentation foods or drinks and the best practices that can be taught by food educators to participants to make at home with minimal equipment. I've chosen to go through sauerkraut, yogurt, and kombucha with you today. I will point out how understanding safe food handling skills as well as the control over the environmental conditions needed for partnering with microorganisms to cultivate fermentation ecology can be applied to other products as well. And then second, leverage the field of fermentation 
as a safe and pleasant way to preserve agricultural products or create desirable foods or drinks. Fermented products are not a cure-all, nor are they the worst thing ever. They can fit in a healthful diet and should fit in our food culture. Often the first step is to accept and implement a mindset shift that encourages microbial growth, meaning be okay with beneficial bacteria, yeasts, and or molds. Second step is to try them. Broaden the palate for taste, texture, smell, mouthfeel appearance, and overall perception of these microbial masterpieces. Try new ways to let fermented foods and drinks fit. Uh, to meet these objectives, here is our outline for today's, today's session. Today we'll start with the what of fermentation. Some of this may be review for those of you that attended earlier sessions of this um, professional development training. Um, and then also I will invite you to consider, you know, your fermentation story, you know, before we review the microbiology of fermentation. Uh, second, the why of fermentation. Again, some of this will be a brief review from previous sessions and then we'll address safety of fermentation. And finally, we'll move into the third part of the session on how to ferment foods and non-alcoholic beverages. I'll give tools for you to do at home or confidently teach others, as well as incorporate tips on including fermented products in the diet. Um, first, um, my fermentation story. You know, a word often used to describe fermentation is transformative. I fully embrace that this means more than just the physical change of barley to beer, but what it does to our food culture as well. We all have a fermentation story. Maybe some of you are fermentation gurus, and maybe some of you have stories that are just developing. But that's the thing, no matter your geographical location, cultural history, or biological food preferences, we all have had fermented foods and or beverages. Some dietary patterns are rich in fermented products. Some dietary patterns may rely on foods that have a traditional history in fermentation that are now produced in ways that no longer partner with microorganisms. Think of your story as I tell you a little bit about mine. Think about your first sour bite of fermented vegetables or that bubbling flour and water that you successfully turned into bread. Or maybe you've taken on a COVID project to homebrew. Your story is important for appreciating the intersection of the art and science in culture and food and drinks. Now, I first started actively fermenting when I was pregnant with my first daughter. Um, that's her on the left many years ago. Um, I loved yogurt, but I hated always buying it in those plastic jugs. So not knowing a thing about what I was getting myself into, I found a basic recipe online and gave it a try. Around that time, uh, the Colorado State University Food Safety Extension Specialist and Professor recruited me as a grad student to develop a fermentation course and outreach materials. And somehow out of worry, you know, for my safety, she convinced my mother to buy me an incubator to make my yogurt. Um, she wanted to encourage me to learn and practice safe skills. And my plain homemade yogurt became a favorite food among all my children. I realized though, I had so much to learn to develop that fermentation course. Um, and it was really, really motivating for me to be able to learn through eating. I tried kombucha for the first time and fell in love. I experimented with vegetable ferments and discovered that my children love sauerkraut. Um, along with my personal trials, we used our campus kitchen to test products and processes for safe recipe development and training. The undergraduate course provided students hands-on opportunities to work with food entrepreneurs in yogurt, sauerkraut, kombucha, as well as sourdough cheeses, sausage, kimchi, pickles, kefirs, um, tempeh, as well as countless diverse, unique delectables um, they got to craft with microbe partners. With the tools I gained from researching and teaching in the classroom, I also led hands-on trainings um, and um, developed materials uh, for Colorado Extension educators. My practice benefited from hearing stories from learners who didn't realize that helping their parents homebrew or stacking cucumbers into a salt brine was working with microorganisms to preserve and create. So what is fermentation? It occurs through bonding with good microbes. Fermentation of food takes place because of microorganisms. That is what makes this a unique food processing technique. 
we want the special beneficial microorganisms. Unlike canning, where we sterilize and heat process to effectively remove all microorganisms, we need to set the environment to favor the growth of the beneficial fermenting microorganisms. There are two kingdoms of fermenting microorganisms, the bacteria and fungi, you know, which includes molds and yeasts. Um, the microorganisms used may be existing on the food, such as with cabbage used to make sauerkraut or as a, as a starter culture, um, such as to make milk into yogurt or sweet tea into kombucha. Bacteria are effective co-evolutionary partners because they're highly adaptable and mutable. They continually monitor their external and internal environments and make adjustments. They have to survive among the pathogens, producing protective inhibitory substances. Fermentation is a broad term encompassing countless microorganisms, their activity, raw agricultural substrates, metabolic end products, and unique end products, including enzymes, alcohol, carbon dioxide, and organic acids. Fermentation is a metabolic process. Carbohydrates mostly are food for this diverse ecology of microorganisms that will then thrive in a managed environment anaerobically transforming the raw substrate into a completely unique end product with metabolic end products such as acids, gases, and or alcohol. Ferment comes from the Latin root, ver ver, which means to boil because of the release of these gases from products that visually looks like boiling. Fermentation has a transformative effect. It changes the initial food substrate into a completely new food or drink. Think grapes that become wine, two distinct products. Um, fermentation has its roots as a food preservation method. Um, earliest records of fermentation go back to at least 9,000 years to wine produced in ancient China. Historically, fermented products identified a gastronomic sense of place and linked people in collaboration with local ecology of microorganisms, agriculture, utensils, and climate to form techniques independently evolved through regional agriculture and environmental conditions passed among people. Global practices and products still find a place at the table in geographic and social food cultures. Over time, processes have been developed to create traditional and new desirable flavors and products with researched and potential health benefits. With the reach and development of fermentation, there's more to discover about the art and science of its transformative effect. When fermenting, especially with any vegetable, the goal is to work with the microorganism partners to produce the acid that will create a safe acidified product. You don't add vinegar or acid, that would be pickling. You can make traditional pickles from vegetables by creating the acid. This is where some of the language can be confusing. In some cultures, any fermented vegetable is called a pickle. In our society, a pickle is a cucumber and a vinegar brine. Some fermenters like to use the term lacto-fermentation when talking about fermentation that encourages lactic acid development, but even that term is not necessary. Uh, Louis Pasteur defined fermentation as decomposition in the absence of air. Uh, there are a few main metabolic pathways. We can categorize food and beverage fermentation based on the main end product from the metabolism of sugar, whether lactic acid, um, or acetic acid or alcohol and carbon dioxide. In food and beverage fermentation, our lactic acid fermenting microorganisms metabolize glucose to produce energy and pyruvate. In the absence of oxygen, homolactic bacteria, uh, shown on the left, you know, including some commonly found in plant and dairy ferments, reduce pyruvate to, pyruvate, excuse me, to lactic acid as the main end product. In the case of the heterolactic bacteria on the right, including some found in vegetable ferments, um, Along with the lactic acid, uh, carbon dioxide and ethanol are also produced as main end products. Uh, yeast follows a similar pathway to break down glucose, except it's converted to acetaldehyde and produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. One interesting thing to think about is how the different end products are used in producing the food or drink desired. Like with bread, it's the carbon dioxide that is beneficial from this glycolytic pathway. Carbon dioxide aids in leavening and forming the desired texture. Whereas with beer fermentation, even though it's often the same yeast used for bread and many of the same grains, it's the alcohol that's the desired end product. Fermentation can involve one or more types of more microorganisms, 
often it's the succession of the microorganisms that is important. For example, um, acetic acid bacteria, commonly found in kombucha, would then convert the ethanol produced by yeast to acetic acid. Um, other ways of grouping fermented foods and beverages are by the starting food substrate, such as grains, vegetables, fruit, dairy, or meats. As a dietitian, I often you know, consider them based on these food groups um, as there are similarities in how to control the environment or how the sugars are fermented to acidify the environment. So fermented products are an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community of living organism, organisms together with the non-living components of their environment. Traditional products are rooted in evolution of centuries of human and microbial relationships and the interactions within and shaping the ecosystem. Our role is to control the conditions of the environment for this process of transformation from cabbage to kraut and successfully and enjoyably include fermented foods as part of a healthful dietary pattern to be part of and contribute to our human ecosystem as well. When it comes to including fermented products in a diet, the best rule of thumb is my same advice I would give you as a dietitian, variety, balance, and moderation. Choose different food fermented products across food groups. Start small and gradually increase in amount. Some people may react differently and may need time to get used to a product. Remember, you are consuming a new ecosystem. And like any new food, try it in different ways. Try it with foods and drinks you already enjoy. Properly fermented foods and drinks can be beneficial. And that brings me to why ferment foods. You know, often the major benefits to fermentation are generalized as preservation, health, energy efficiency, and flavor. I choose to combine and expand to summarize the benefits under the headings, food security, flavor, and health. Uh, food security, fermentation has its roots in food preservation as a way to safely improve a substrate's shelf life. The process of safe fermenting can create a product that prevents pathogenic contamination. Fermentation can involve reduced resource expenditure, such as less cooking fuels or cooking times, um, which is important for things like beans, or less refrigeration needed for perishable foods. These especially hold great, important, great importance globally in maintaining food security. For people in developing countries, food security is, enhan is enhanced through the benefits um, listed as well as the added availability to salvage food waste and use more of the agricultural products, as well as increased economic opportunities through production and sales um, and traditional uses for um, health attributes. For flavor, the new products made are unique and tasty. They have desirable um, sensory qualities like texture, appearance, aroma, um, which all can be transformed. And globally, fermented foods are staples of the human diet. You know, consider Korean kimchi, Ethiopian injera, Russian kvass, you know, to name a few. Health. Health benefits vary by product, but in general, some nutrients are enhanced in the process, as well as enzymes, you know, present for digestibility. Some products have living microorganisms that confer, confer health benefits to the consumer. Uh, chemical compounds produced, including organic acids and other altered compounds, may positively impact our gut microbiota, this in turn beneficially influencing health outcomes like mental health and risk of chronic disease or cancer. And enzyme activity reduces some anti-nutrients, such as phytic acid and grains, which then um, influences and increases nutrient availability, as well as in some cases, toxic effects can be inhibited from fermenting, making food safely consumable. Among these three benefits, health benefits have had a significant impact on the revitalization of fermented foods in our Western diet. Food safety is fundamental in fermentation. To understand, you need to think on a microscopic level. 
Factors that affect microbial growth impact safety and quality. Factors include those that are intrinsic you know, or internal to the food and extrinsic or those that are external, you know, part of the food um, environment. Um, intrinsic include, intrinsic, geez, include um, acidity or pH, moisture content or water activity, um, oxidation reduction potential, you know, which has to do with oxygen present in the food as well as metabolic activity of the microorganism, uh, the nutrient content, um, antimicrobial properties uh, or inhibitory substances, and biological structures, including uh, protective coverings of the food, like the rind or outside covering of a fruit or vegetable. Extrinsic or external include temperature, relative humidity, atmosphere, um, gases like um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the presence and activities of other microorganisms. Across all these factors is also the interactions of the microorganisms, um, or also event or force that would cause a disturbance and change the ecosystem. Um, interactions in the ecosystem you know, shape the suitable environment. I always think, you know, from a food service or food safety perspective, you know, consider the mnemonic device from microbial growth fat tom. You know, yet our goal is to cultivate, you know, by controlling the food, acidity, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. We want to set the environment for favorable growth of the fermenting microorganisms. <laughs> Fermented products when done properly are safe. In fact, food safety experts state that fermented veggies can be safer than raw. And thankfully, many fermented products are easy to do safely. Start by practicing safe food handling skills, um, like personal hygiene, including ha hand washing, um, adhering to standards of cleanliness in the workspace and food products. Um, and following sanitation steps are critical. For most, for most food products, sanitation um, is enough, um, whereas some products such as beer, wine, sausages, or hard cheeses would require sterilization. Or when culturing multiple microorganisms in a workspace or using shared utensils, sterilization can minimize undesirable cross-contamination. For example, cheese makers um, will need to plan you know, um, aging space spaces as cheese molds spread. You know, some mold spread may be pleasing for artisanal effects, but I've heard stories from cheesemakers that found blue specks from blue cheese molds showing up for years in the most unlikely spaces. Um, environmental factors that impact safety also contribute to overall quality. So even fermenters with little knowledge or concern for safety would be motivated to practice these steps knowing that a successful final product can be at risk. Preventive controls or steps to reduce food safety risks such as acidity, salt, alcohol, carbon dioxide, lack of oxygen, and antimicrobial compounds will differ product to product because they differ for the respective fermenting microorganism. But these preventive controls produced by fermenting microorganisms can shape an environment so it is no longer safe for the pathogenic microorganisms. This is an important point about why fermentation is safe. Encouraging the growth of the beneficial microorganisms will make an environment that is unsuitable for pathogenic microorganisms. Help the good bugs thrive so the bad bugs cannot survive. Um, many of you, you know, are likely you know, the experts in canning, drying, and freezing, um, and so the thought of bacteria is frightening. Uh, which is why I want to remind you to think about this food preservation method on a microscopic level and remember that fermentation and food safety go hand in hand. I'm sure some of you are wondering what the image on the right is. Um, this image, much like um, I think most, most of the images in this presentation are my own personal pictures. Um, this came from an attempt to make kombucha from a dehydrated SCOBY. Uh, based on the mold that grew uh, from two different attempts, I can hardly state that I do not recommend using a dehydrated SCOBY to try to make kombucha. Um, but this is an example of um, what mold growth yeah, looks like on kombucha. 
So speaking of kombucha, let's transition to learning how to make three different basic food, excuse me, basic fermented products. We'll do sauerkraut, yogurt, and kombucha. We'll touch on the basics in my presentation. And at the end, I'll provide links to resources and recipes for making and teaching on your own. In my experience, these three come up the most for interest as they are quite easy to master with minimal equipment. Um, some might even call them gateway ferments because once you've mastered these, you can tackle more complex product, products like cheese or even kimchi. When it comes to fermenting, the processes can be broken down into these four basic steps. Prepare the raw agricultural substrate, activate the cultures, whether wild or starter, ferment, and store. Now the exact methods will need to be modified for the particular substrate culture and end product goal, but having this basic structure can help outline any fermentation project you may tackle. For each of the project, or excuse me, products I'll go through and other ferments, in addition to um, safety procedures mentioned, best practices within, within each step include um, for preparation and activation, quality in equals quality out for both the substrate and the culture. Um, utensils or vessels must be food grade and appropriate for the product. Um, clean, first of all, and um, sturdy glass, um, possibly stainless steel, or food grade plastics are generally the safest. Um, avoid crocks with cracks. Uh, for fermenting, um, temperature, um, use a thermometer and know the incubation range needed. Uh, time, some will take hours, days, months, years. Uh, space, again, plan for an uncontaminating, uncontaminating spot. And then oxygen, is it needed or is it not? Um, and before storing, you know, especially while you learn the cues for when products are ready, consider using objective measures to ensure safety, such as a pH meter or pH strips. Okay, let's, there we go. Start with sauerkraut. Now, um, I'm in Minnesota and we like it here on bratwursts. Um, some people might like it on a Reuben sandwich. Um, personally, I love sauerkraut as a condiment for anything, especially eggs or as a salad topping. Um, my children will actually eat it just by the spoonful as a side dish. The name sauerkraut is German for sour herb or sour cabbage, but it actually originated in China. It was introduced to Eastern Europe and has become most associated with German cooking. Cabbage and salt are the only added ingredients. Uh, there are regional varieties such as adding caraway seeds or juniper, juniper berries you know, to contribute to flavor. Sauerkraut contributes vitamin C and fiber, you know, which historically had great benefit for health over long winters with low access to fresh produce. If it is kept cool and the top surface is not exposed to air, sauerkraut is said to be able to be kept indefinitely. I will um, remind you though that with each use, it will introduce oxygen and negatively impact quality over time. My German grandma-in-law has told me stories of the buried crock they would have as a child that would have a mold layer formed on top like a blanket that they would peel back each day to scoop out that you know, crisp acidic sauerkraut underneath. With that, mold can form on sauerkraut. Some experts would warn that the entire batch should be discarded, while others would state that as long as the vegetables remain under the brine, you can scrape off the mold and what is underneath will be fine. Um, I've, ex I've done it both ways, depending on the mold growth. Sometimes there's just a piece of cabbage floating above the brine that's affected, while the remaining kraut is not. In that case, I scoop that away and eat the remaining kraut. Sometimes, and I'll share an image here, like in this image, um, this batch was clearly compromised. Uh, this was a student project using purple cabbage, um, and they tried to reduce the salt 
and they left it um, on way down so it was not submerged under brine and they left it unattended for too long. So this would be um, one I would not recommend consuming. Um, and I will say, as I share this in preparing my slides, I realize I have a lot of pictures of things that went wrong. Uh, anyway, sauerkraut again is a common condiment, but can also be used in recipes from dips to desserts. Um, I'll share a publication um, from the University of Wisconsin Extension at the end that has a recipe for chocolate cake made with sauerkraut that is very good. The ingredients for sauerkraut are cabbage and salt. Um, in these pictures, I'm making a, a variation of, um, of sauerkraut. Um, obviously, I've added ingredients. These just happen to be pictures that I had. This is actually um, Curtido, as you can see, there's um, carrot, onion, jalapenos, spices. It's a Salvadoran um, condiment, much like sauerkraut, but we'll, we can still follow along. So you start with cabbage that is fresh, firm, and clean. Uh, shred it with either you know knife, kraut cutter, mandolin, food processor, or you know other shredding tool. The point is to increase the surface area of the cabbage for bacteria exposure as well as cut the cell walls to start the release of the carbohydrate-containing juices from the cabbage. The microorganisms you need are already present on the cabbage. There's no need for starter culture. And you'll mix with salt. Non-iodized is recommended for overall quality, um, but it's not required. Less refined salts that are richer in chem, or excuse me, richer in minerals can aid in quality. Uh, salt is key in the process. It further draws out liquids, uh, maintains crisp vegetables, um, and creates a selective environment for salt tolerant lactic acid bacteria to outcompete pathogenic microorganisms. It also slows the fermentation process and activity, acting as a preservative. We did an experiment. Um, with different salts on cabbage. Um, salt did you know, impact um, taste qualities of the final product. These pictures again show um, an ethnic variation called curtido. Um, the picture on the bottom shows mixing the uniformly cut vegetables with the salt um, and it's starting to draw out the liquid. Uh, the mixture can at this point can then be massaged to further draw out liquid or left to rest for about 30 minutes or so to fully draw out enough liquid to serve as the brine. The picture on the right shows packing the curtido into a jar for fermentation. You can see the brine level above the vegetables. This is important. That brine helps to fully cover the vegetables, reducing oxygen exposure. You can also see that just like when canning foods, you also want to rid the vessel of air bubbles. Pack the vegetables tightly. Bubbles can leave oxygen exposure and spots for undesirable microorganism growth. The bacterial strains responsible for ferment vegetable fermentation are social microorganisms, and we are part of their creative interplay to foster that environment for their growth and development. There are three main stages of bacterial sequencing. As one bacteria starts to slow down due, an, due to an increased acidity, you know, the enzymes still function. The lactic acid bacteria are diverse and adaptable, which contributes to their success as fermenting organisms. Um, the first stage on the left um, can live in a range of temperatures. They produce the most carbon dioxide in that initial stage. Therefore, watch for bubbles in the first three days and be careful to avoid explosions. Um, during the second stage, um, Lactobacillus plantarum plays a main role in all vegetable ferments. Um, it it, it um, greatly increases the acidity, overall decreasing the pH. The final stage occurs concurrently um, in producing less acid. Um, these are simply um, representatives and main ones, but there are over 200 different bacteria often detected in wild fermented vegetables. Again, over time, through the progression of the succession, the overall pH will drop. Um, again, starter cultures are unnecessary. 
uh, use of starter cultures could encourage consistency. Um, it can also you know, help speed up the process and impart some control. Um, a starter would simply start the process and die off you know, for this, the bacteria, excuse me, sauerkraut bacteria to take over. Um, but often starter cultures include later organisms and the quality can be compromised due to going out of turn in the cultural sequencing. Um, back slopping or using old you know, sauerkraut juice you know, can help introduce crop bacteria, but if it is too acidic, it can also inhibit, again, those early um, lactic acid bacteria, which leads to a product um, that is generally softer. Other liquid ferments or byproducts like whey, water kefir, sauerkraut, um, or excuse me, or other vegetable juice, brine, um, even kombucha or commercially available, available strains, you know, have been used for lower salt variations, um, but again, they would also impact the overall quality. The basic process to make sauerkraut, you know, follows this outline. First, prepare the cabbage. This also prepares the culture and initiates wild fermentation. Second, dry salt meaning that we add the salt to that will create the brine, unlike with a like a pickle where you would make the brine. And then submerge the cabbage under the brine. Preferably weigh it down to keep it submerged. There are weights designed for this, or you can use something like a baggie filled with brine or a smaller jar or plate that can fit inside your vessel. There's other specialized equipment available um, that can make the step easier, but again, they're not necessary. Uh, I would say though, someone who wants to be less hands-on would benefit from something that's an airlock style or the traditional water seal crock. Um, but in my experience, you can produce a quality product simply by monitoring and managing the environment. This means checking on the ferment and occasionally re-weighing down the vegetables to keep them fully submerged. Once they're submerged, cover the vessel, um, fingertip tight if it's, if, it's a, if it's a cover or a tight weave cloth. Um, this is to keep out contaminants, but then allow, allow gas to release. Um, and then the fourth step to ferment. This process will go slower in colder temperatures and faster in warmer temperatures. Uh, you should place it on a plate or a tray, um, especially in the first few days because bubbles um, will be produced and some liquid may bubble out. Um, at that point then, make sure if you're not using a traditional crock or airlock, you know, check for the submerged vegetables um, and re-weigh them down if needed. Any liquid or vegetables that did escape should be discarded. Um, escaped Liquid that dries out may have a you know, white crystal-like residue from the salt. All of that is okay, but keep the outside of the vessel clean, wipe it down occasionally to reduce interest from other pests or organisms. Once the pH has dropped, the succession of the bacteria continues and less bubbling will occur. You'll see the most bubbling within the first three days. Acid will continue to be produced. Um, a pH under 4.6 is considered acidified and safe, but the final pH will be closer to 3.5. This may take between one to three weeks, again, depending on the temperature, but also depending on the size of the vessel. Personally, I use a lot of um, quart size canning jars. Um, and when I make it in you know, fall Minnesota weather, about 10 days is sufficient um, for the quality I prefer. At this point, the kraut can now be you know, cooled to store and enjoy. Cooling the sauerkraut will slow the enzyme activity and slow the fermentation. It can be kept long-term at this stage. Canning and freezing are unnecessary. They will dramatically alter the quality as well as kill off bacteria present. Next, we'll jump into how to ferment yogurt. Um, it's been pro proposed that the earliest food produced through fermentation was over 8,000 years ago in the region of present-day Middle East along the Mediterranean Sea. People living at that time recognized that the milk of their goats and sheep was 
nutritive and wanted to store it for themselves. So they used what they had available, the stomachs from animals. When the milk was stored in the animal stomachs, growth of lactic acid bacteria occurred, the bacteria fermented the milk, and the lactic acid byproducts increased the acidity of the milk, preserving it from spoilage. An increased acidity coagulates the caseins, the main proteins in milks, and also enzymes present in the stomachs that curdle the milk. So this initial product was much like our sour cream, which was then um, usable to make butter or cheese by adding salt to extend the shelf life. In the early 1900s, uh, Russian biologist Mechnikov attributed the long life of Bulgarians to eating yogurt. Um, this sparked a huge global interest in yogurt, and yogurt consumption has risen dramatically since that first craze. Uh, since the 1940s, with the introduction of value-added yogurts, you literally cannot go into a grocery store without being overwhelmed with dozens of brands and types to choose from. Homemade yogurt can be strained to make a thicker style like Greek yogurt. Um, fruit or sweeteners can be added to replicate flavored yogurts. Yogurt can also be used as a substitute for sour cream or buttermilk in recipes. Uh, yogurt works well in smoothies, you know, topped with granola. Yogurt has become quite prevalent in our food culture. Homemade yogurt must be refrigerated and can be kept 10 to 21 days. Yogurt is legally defined as a fermented milk product using at minimum symbiotic cultures of Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactobacillus delbruchiae subspecies bulgaricus. Mouthful. Um, they are thermophilic lactic acid bacteria, meaning that they prefer warm temperatures around 110 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. They work synergistically to create the unique flavors that arise from metabolizing lactose to produce lactic acid and other products. Increased acid will decrease the pH, contribute to the tart flavor, preserve the product from pathogenic microorganisms, and allow for the milk proteins to aggregate into the gel formation. Both of these cultures are important to the final flavor, um, and a shift in the balance favoring one over the other will alter the final product. Um, other bacteria can also be used for other desirable attributes. Um, the only other ingredient, milk, can be any animal-based milk, you know, cow's milk, for example, or any fat type. Plant-based milks will need additional ingredients to mimic the gel formation process. Um, higher fat milks will set firmer and have a richer taste. If using fat-free or low-fat milk, uh, you should add non-fat dry milk solids. These cultures uh, can be purchased directly, dried or frozen, or it can come from a batch of yogurt. The, if you use a yogurt, um, the product you need to be, you know, minimal product, so no, you know, fillers that are aiding in stability or other flavorings. Cultures can be used batch to batch, which is referred to as, you know, back slopping, you know, for multiple generations. Uh, depending on the care of the culture and specificity of a commercially prepared culture, the quality or stability may decrease and should be replaced over time. The basic process for yogurt fermentation is to start with pasteurized milk. Again, it's optional to add non-fat dry milk powder to increase protein solids. Second, heat the milk. This is an important step. It denatures milk proteins and helps for the optimal gel formation of the final product instead of curdling. Um, heat the milk to at least 175, uh, 185 is optimal, um, but avoid boiling. Boiling the milk can cause an off flavor and texture. And then holding the milk at that higher temperature will cause liquid to evaporate and result in a thicker milk. Um, holding it at 185 for 10 minutes will result in a thinner yogurt, whereas 20 minutes would be thicker. Then cool the milk to the optimal temperature range for the culture, which again is around 110 degrees Fahrenheit. This can be done quite quickly by placing in a cold water bath. Monitor the temperature so that you do not add the cultures too soon and inadvertently kill them. 
Now to inoculate the heated, then cooled milk, remove about a cup of the milk and blend it with the starter culture. This helps mix it thoroughly. Blend that mixture with the rest of the milk. That does help to ensure that the culture is um, mixed thoroughly with the entire batch. Pour the milk into clean containers for incubation. Um, again, I use half pint, pint or quart size you know, canning jars. Um, cover and place in a prepared incubator, sitting undisturbed for about four to 12 hours. The incubator could be a yogurt incubator. It could be um, an oven, a cooler, a slow cooker or multi-cooker. Any of those type of um, devices that can, you can carefully control and monitor the temperature. Um, I've had success with each of those listed. Um, some are easier to maintain and control than others. I definitely prefer one that can, the temperature can be easily maintained at 110 um, for about eight hours. Yogurt will set firm when the pH reaches 4.6, and at that point, refrigerate immediately. It will stop acid development. Yogurt that is left incubating longer or not cooled right away will be very tart. Trust me. For our last product, we'll discuss how to ferment kombucha. Now, I'm sure that some of you have tried kombucha. And, you know, some of you who've tried it, I'm sure, you know, maybe thinking, ooh, that was a little tart. Um, some of you, like myself, might be thinking, oh, I really enjoyed that. Um, but those of you who've never tried it, it can be described as tangy, slightly cider-like, you know, effervescent. Um, it is acidic tasting. It can be sweetened and flavored, you know, which does help each batch, batch excuse me, to taste, taste unique. Kombucha is a functional beverage made by fermenting sweet tea. It likely originated in um, about 220 BC in Northeast China, where it spread in popularity due to its supposed health effects. It is consumed worldwide and only gained popularity in the United States in the 80s and 90s with interest in immune health properties. It is traditionally made from black tea and cane sugar. At home and commercial brewers experiment with the type of tea and sweetener for desired properties. Uh, many use now a combination of black and green tea. Um, but keep in mind that added sugar is for the microorganisms. So changing the sweetener will have an impact on the process. The kombucha ecosystem is comprised of and impacted by yeasts, uh, the dominant acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria and the succession and the interactions between them. The tea substrate supplies nutrients for the fermentation process to produce the metabolites that will drop the pH um, under in aerobic conditions. Uh, the cellulose mat that forms in the fermentation process is often referred to as a SCOBY, which stands for symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. It's sometimes erroneously referred to as a mushroom, but it's not a fungi. It only looks like one. Uh, the SCOBY forms a protective layer that creates this happy home for the fermenting yeast and bacteria, as well as keep out contaminating microorganisms. Other words um, for it include biofilm, because it's this rubbery, culturally structure, um, or a mother, as it will continue to grow new layers or babies that can be then shared and used to create a new batch. SCOBY composition can vary wide, widely due to location and environmental factors. There are a number of compounds that may be present in kombucha, um, but analysis of kombucha mothers from around the world have found that there are bacteria and yeast common to kombucha mothers. Um, most of them, there's, um, excuse me, one, pre, one predominant um, acetic acid bacteria genus that accounted for most of the bacteria. Um, which produces the acetic acid as well as the cellulose forming that uh, mat. Uh, lactobacillus genus um, was found in many and then for producing um, some lactic acid as well as polysaccharides. And then zygosaccharomyces yeast, you know, dominated the, the, the samples um, and that makes carbon dioxide and alcohol, which then can be converted to acetaldehyde by the acetic acid bacteria. 
over about you know two weeks time the organic acid content increases including gluconic acid and acetic acid which decreases the overall ph increasing the safety of the final product kombucha follows a two-stage fermentation and the first is yeast fermentation in this stage alcohol will be produced from sugar um, yeast are found in solution and under the SCOBY in the anaerobic environment. They'll metabolize sucrose to form glucose and fructose. Glucose will be converted to organic acids, carbon dioxide and ethanol, and the fructose will remain in solution. The second stage is the bacterial fermentation. Bacteria will convert the ethanol to acetaldehyde and acetic acid. It will also produce cellulose, cellulose to form the SCOBY and gluconic acid. So over time, alcohol content decreases, sugar content decreases, and acid content increases. The overall pH will drop to about 2.5 for the final product. A trace amount of alcohol may be present in the final product. The simplified process of brewing kombucha is first brew strong tea. Boiling the water will kill vegetative pathogens. Add the tea and steep for 10 minutes. This will brew a strong tea. Um, and remember, this is for the microorganisms, not you. Um, remove the tea bags or leaves, and while the tea is still hot, add sugar. This will help the sugar to fully dissolve because you generally use about a cup of sugar per one gallon of prepared tea. Cool the tea to room temperature. This can be done again quickly in a cold water bath. Once it is cool, add a solid SCOBY and about one cup of starter liquid. The SCOBY might look like the one at the top, or yours may not be quite as bumpy, um, but the starter liquid comes from a previous batch of kombucha. This is important to add as it will quickly acidify the environment and reduce contamination from pathogenic microorganisms. The SCOBY should come from a trusted source, either an acquaintance that is willing to share from their personal SCOBY or ordering it from a reputable source online. Again, don't use a dehydrated SCOBY. Once the cultures are added, cover securely with a thick weave towel or cloth to allow for gas exchange, but it restricts insects or contaminants from entering. Again, I can say from experience, this step is important. Uh, let the kombucha sit undisturbed at room temperature or slightly warmer for one to two weeks. It will take longer at cooler temperatures. The culture will start to form a new culture on the top of the tea surface. From those of you from northern climates like myself, it'll look kind of like ice forming on a lake. Um, but for those of you who have no idea what that looks like, see the bottom picture. It starts out hazy and will turn opaque as it grows thicker. Keep the contents acidic and covered. The active culture will outcompete mold. If you're new to brewing kombucha, this growth may look questionable, but unless it is patchy, fuzzy, colorful, it's not mold, and it's okay. Any sign of mold though, and all contents need to be discarded. The vessel will need to be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized. When it's complete, pour the kombucha into bottles or jars. Keep the SCOBY and at least 20% of the liquid in the brew vessel to start a new batch. Kombucha can be refrigerated, enjoyed as is, or flavored, and let sit at room temperature to allow carbon dioxide to build up. But only leave it at room temperature for one to three days, or it could explode. Uh, following the method for a continuous brew is clean and easy. It keeps the SCOBY and starter liquid in the brew vessel to minimize handling. It's a way to quickly make new kombucha as well. Simply make new sweet tea, cool it, and pour it back into the brew vessel, minimizing disturbance on the SCOBY. The SCOBY will continue to grow thicker and thicker, and layers can be peeled and shared with others or stored for later as needed. The SCOBY will work optimally if not left to grow too thick. And there's dozens of ways to flavor and experiment. Um, the easiest way to do that is to simply add, you know, fruit or herb to finished pro, excuse me, the finished kombucha, cap it tightly, let it sit at room temperature for one to three days, strain out the fruit or herb and enjoy the flavored bubbly beverage. I say fruit or herb because my favorite combination is grapefruit and basil. Very good. When it comes to putting these products into practice, you truly learn well from trial and error um, and put these steps into place for optimal quality. Follow good hygiene practices, 
adhere to methods, including safe fermentation vessels, excuse me, and recipes, monitor temperatures and times, observe results, and learn by eating and enjoying. Now the last few slides are um, resources that I've compiled. Some of my favorites that I would recommend as you know, evidence-based resources um, by category. These are certainly not all that there's out there, but these again are ones that I've found to be accurate and useful. Um, this first one lists two different sauerkraut resources. Um, the first one being the one from the University of Wisconsin Extension. Um, it's a classic that I feel like many many have you know used to write new and updated variations, including um, the one that I wrote for Colorado State um, University Extension. Um, and these, are, of course, are available in your slides. So I'll kind of whip through these a little bit. Um, kombucha resources. Um, this first one is very helpful um, as the um, a kombucha brewing under the Food and Drug Administration Model Food Code. It's a lot about um, safety practices. Um, the second is one that I helped to um, collaborate and write for Colorado State University Extension. For yogurt, um, again, we have this um, useful guide from uh, Brian Nummer, um, and then also one from Washington State University Extension that I found to be um, useful. I did find with many yogurt um, recipes from um, I guess academic sources include a lot of unnecessary steps or ingredients. So I do just recommend, you know, keep the process simple. And then in terms of general resources, um, these are some of my favorites. Um, the first article is just a very well written one with, you know, quotes from experts. Um, Sander Katz, he is a non-academic, but fascinating, well-respected in the field of fermentation. He's um, He's kind of stated as starting the revolution with his, with his book, Wild Fermentation. Um, there's a lot of resources for um, purchasing things. Cultures for Health has been one that I've gone to quite a bit. They've been very useful. They also have other recipes and so forth. I did put the last um, link from the National Center for Home Food Preservation because I recognize that they you know, are um, you know, the gold standard resource for most methods of preservation. I do feel like this, um, Fermentation resources is not the most, um, I guess, clear and accurate, but that is also an option. Um, again, here's my, I guess, contact information. This was on the first slide as well. If you have further questions, because I realize we are running out of time for questions, but at this point, I would like to open it up to potential questions. Well, Dr. Bauer, thank you so much. We do have a list of questions for you and I know we're only going to have time for a few um, but would it be okay if we sent you the list um, following today's presentation to get your feedback so we could share it with all of the participants? I'd be more than happy to. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. So just to, to um, use a little bit of time that we do have, um, one question when you were talking about yogurt, um, a participant wanted to make the yogurt um, but would you recommend an Instapot? What are your thoughts? I love using Instapot. I started using one myself personally, and that's the only way I do it now. I will say I found that it comes out kind of thinner, and so I tend to, I, I, I do, I add some steps to help, you know, increase the evaporation stage in the beginning, um, but yeah, that is a great tool. I will say I do wish I had more control over the temperature. So that is one downfall for the Instant Pot or those kind of um, multi-cookers, um, but it is, it is um, a safe, useful tool. All right, thank you. And another question was, do we need to be concerned about the salt in the sauerkraut as half of US adults have hypertension? So, and keep in mind too, sauerkraut consumption is recommended you know, as a condiment. I mean, my children are probably the only people that eat it as a, as a dish. Um, and so, yes, it is high in salt content. Um, but of course, when choosing, again, small amounts, you know, as a moderate part of the diet, um, it can still fit in a healthy diet. Um, yes, individuals that are at risk for, you know, hypertension, um, they can rinse the sauerkraut, which would help to reduce, you know, salt. Um, that does, you know, also impact, you know, the overall quality of the product, um, but that is certainly an option. Right, and then I'm going to try to sneak one more in um, for uh, regarding sauerkraut as well. Can ceramic containers used to hold cabbage and brine liquid 
as it is fermenting when mold occurs at the top due to brine reduction toward end of fermentation be reused? So let me see if I'm getting this. So can a, so can a container be, be reused if, if there is mold production? Is that what I'm hearing? So, let, me, let me repeat it one more time. So it says, can ceramic containers used to hold cabbage and brine liquid as it's fermenting, even when mold occurs at the top due to the brine reduction, can that be reused? And I'm not certain now if it's the container. Sure. And I think if I'm, if I'm hearing this correctly, mm -hmm. um, I think the way I would answer that is some of it does depend on you know the mold um again if it's if there is just like a, a like i've had this often happen where there's just a small piece of cabbage on top you know that you know molded and so you know removal of that yes that entire container can then be reused but if that container becomes severely cam contaminated kind of like that picture i showed um i think it would really come down to whether that container could be you know thoroughly cleaned well enough um, that's another reason why I love using things like glass that I know that I can um, sterilize pretty readily. Yeah. All right. And it is 4.01. And just to be respectful of everyone's time, we want to thank you again, Dr. Bauer, for your time today and an excellent presentation on fermentation. I know I've gained some great insight from today's talk. And again, we'll be sharing these questions with you um, to get feedback to everyone who attended today.